continuation on the theme of Libre Space. Now we are going to talk about the, uh, the, the deployer, so please welcome Thanos. Hello everyone, so I'm Thanos, I'm also a core contributor at the Libre Space, I'm a mechanical engineer too, and I will continue the talk of Elias basically and add some stuff about the satellite's final safe house, the deployer, and specifically our own deployer, the Picobus. So, some words about the deployer. What's a deployer? So now that our satellites are like the cubic small, you need to have a way to attach it to a rocket. Okay, so basically, as mentioned before, we build a box, place all the satellites inside, mount the deployer on top of a rocket. Here you can see multiple deployers, actually. And when the time comes, the rocket gives a signal to the deployer and says, okay, open your doors and deploy the satellite. That's what the deployer does. So, how you, do you start designing a deployer, actually? So, that's a really tricky question. <laughs> For us, we knew that we wanted to house 8P units. So, 8 of the cubics, for example, that you can see. So, I will do a quick walkthrough of the internals of the Picobus just to have a bit of context, and then we will dive deeper inside the Picobus itself. So, you start with a rail. You place all the satellites on the rail some way. We will see how. Then you need to push the, sat the satellites outside with some kind of spring most of the times, and then you need all these things to be mounted on the rocket. So you put a flange there to be mounted on the rocket. After that, it's a best practice to close everything, <laughs> because space, and also add some kind of door to keep the satellites inside. So now you have a box with satellites inside that can be pushed outside. But you also need a locking mechanism and deployment mechanism, actually, so when the rocket gives the signal, the satellites do not stay inside, they go in orbit. So that's the final version of the Picobus V1, actually, and these are the main components of it. <laughs> Let's dive deeper now. So again, we start with the rail. Okay, that's uh, one of the most uh, uh, basic parts, but one of the parts that actually restrict you because of the satellites. That's the interface of the satellites and the deployer, too. So we have the pocket cube standard. This is the pocket cube standard, actually, that gives you the dimensions of a pocket cube. And it's available envelope around the pocket cube too. So say, satellite manufacturers can put side pa uh, panels there, sp uh, sometimes even deployable things, which is cool, which is the hot area you can see around. So for the pocket cubes, there's a base plate down where the deployer actually interfaces with this base plate. So we manufactured the rail actually. So the rail, that's a top view of the rail. So you see here it has like a notch where the satellites slide inside and are held from the base plate. So for our uh, specific rail, it was machined out of uh, space-grade aluminum, 7075 T6 alloy. It also was hard anodized to give the surface as much uh, strength as possible because satellites were sliding inside this 2 millimeter slot. So now... Oh. You have to stay here if you yeah, sorry. Camera. Yeah, of course. So... Now we're moving to the pusher subassembly, which is what pushes the satellites outside. So this is a really early version, actually. Uh, we actually try to follow the rapid prototyping procedure as much as possible, so we constantly 3D print parts, break parts, then redesign parts, and then 3D print again parts, and then break them. <laughs> so after much discussion, we opted to use uh, constant force springs. This is really good. It's a good practice because you cannot just take a a proper compression spring and just compress it all the way. <laughs> so it gives you really big range, actually. So with a really quick paper towel calculations, uh, we got a rough estimate of the spring strength and also the satellite exit velocity, which is a really important number <laughs> when you're building a deployer. So when we finished with the paper towel calculations, we actually machined by hand a dummy rail, as you can see there, with 3D printed pushers and barrels and attached the spring to do some testing. So let's see the pusher subassembly in action. That's our first prototype. And okay, it seems to be working. Yeah, and they did a drop of the table. That was a really good one. So it worked. So we moved forward with this design, actually. So again, you can see here the Pico Bus. Uh, you can see one side of the rail. So we have the same assembly mirrored. So we can house 4P on the one side and 4P on the other side. You can see the pusher subassembly here. And you can actually see the machined part in the middle 
the final rail with the pusher that's now machined from PTFE material. It's not 3D printed. So the pusher was made out of a single billet block of Teflon. That uh, Teflon is a really great material because it's space grade, which means it doesn't have gas. It can uh, operate really good in vacuum. It, can also, it also has a really, really small friction coefficient, so it slides amazingly with a hot anodized aluminum. The second part was a barrel. It uh, can be seen in the right side of the photo, which the cost and force spring was wrapped around the barrel. And the spring was attached on the top of, her, of the rail. So in the right picture, you can see the pushes that are in the top. That's the deployed state of the, of the Picobus deployer, actually. So moving on, we now go to the door subassembly and the thermal knives mechanism. So, OK, now we have the rail. We have the pusher subassembly. We need to design the door, too. So you need two things. You need the mechanism to hold the door close, and you need the mechanism to open the door. That's the mechanical thing. You also need, from the electronic side, some way to attach the door and then cut it with a signal from the deployer. So we used this mechanism. These are the early prototypes. So we used the pin puller mechanism with a compression string. And in order to, he to hold the pin in place and actually secure the door closed, we used the Enema string. And in order to cut the Dynema string so the, open, the door would open and the satellite would be deployed, we use thermal knives. Basically, nichrome wire, which is get heated, cuts the Dynema string, the, the spring is decompressed, the pin is pulled, the door opens. So we did more prototyping, and uh, we knew that we had to build electronics from scratch, of course. It was mandatory. So the PCB that we did would handle the communications with the rocket in order to receive the signal, we would also have the thermal knives attached to it and also the deployment switch. Of course, you need a way to see if the door actually opened. So, yeah, we used two thermal knives because space and redundancy, and we also used two Dyneema strings. So only one of the thermal knives needed to work for the deployment to happen, so you have two. It's a more redundant system. So that's the final door subassembly with the machine dev parts and everything. So you can see here the Dyneema string is wrapped around like that, and the two thermal knives are here, one here and one here. So the two strings ho hold the pin inside, they get cut, the doors get released. So the doors of assembly was complete finally, and was ready to be integrated to the rest of the deployer. So behold, that's the deployer, the final deployer, the final Pico bus. You can see here the wire harness. This is getting connected to the rocket, so when the signal is received, the door will open. So now let's see PicoBus in action, actually. So this is uh, the, deploy the deployment test uh, that we did. And um, you will see the thermal knife start starting to glow. There they are. The pin will be pulled back. And then the door will open. And satellites will fly outside. In this specific case, these are dummy mass uh, satellites. They're not actual satellites. They're blocks of aluminum. But yeah, that's how it works, actually. And you can see the pusher subassembly that now it's reached the top there. <laughs> so, uh, continuing now, I want to have some slides about the testing that we do and how do you space grade an assembly, actually. So one of the testing th uh, things that we do is called protoflight testing. Protoflight comes from two words, prototype and flight hardware. So when building PicoBus, <laughs> we had a really short uh, period of time to do everything and build the two satellites that would be inside. So we had six months. So Protoflight helps you with the time that you have to develop uh, really easily. So in this case, the qualification model, so the model that is tested and goes through the vibration and stuff, is the same as the flight hardware, actually. And the satellites were integrated inside PicoBus when this Protoflight campaign happened. So basically, you want to see if, your, if the DUT, the device under testing, will sustain the launch. Actually, launch is a really, really bad time for the deployer and the satellites. A huge vibration, huge accelerations everywhere, and you really need to see and be sure that bolts will not start to fly around, <laughs> pretty much. So the steps are the following. So step one, you do a resonance survey. What that means is you identify the eigenmodes of the system. Actually, you need to have uh, usually the first Resonance should be pretty high, up at about 100 to 150 hertz, but that depends on the launcher, actually. So you get these tables, 
you place the whole deployer into a machine, a vibration table, you vibrate it on all axes, and you get the resonance frequencies for each axis. Then you do a sign vibration profile. So this is where the bad things start to happen up for the deployer. So you basically start punching the deployer with vibrations and the satellites inside and hope it survives and doesn't break. So you pass from 5 Hz to 125 Hz with a sine wave profile. That's really painful to watch. <laughs> but what's even more painful is the random vibration, which is a step 3. That's the real heating. <laughs> and you pass at the same time, in the same machine, from 20 Hz up to 2 kilohertz. So that's the profile. <laughs> and the deployer must sustain this. When uh, random vibration uh, finishes and uh, you are a bit uh, relieved, okay, things seem to go okay, you do quasi static testing, <laughs> which simulates the static loads exerted on the deployer during launch, which again is painful to watch. But when everything is finished, you do again another resonance survey. <laughs> so you add another uh, table, basically, to, to, to there. So you have the post survey resonance. So you need this values, the resonance where before the testing, the testing and the resonance after, should be the same. If they're not the same, something happened. Something flew through, something bro broke. In our case, they were the same, actually. So, yeah. <laughs> Some words now about uh, our design and simulation tools. So, everything we do is open source. The tools we use to do our things are open source too. So we use FreeCAD to do all the modeling, everything. We also use FreeCAD to do all the simulations. Before starting uh, to hit your deployer in the vibration table, you need to do simulations. So we do a lot of model simulations to actually try and predict the eigenmodes before sending uh, the PicoBus to be hit in the vibration table. We also do static simulations because the deployer is bolted uh, from the flange and you have a lot of stress, stresses going around. We use Calculix as a solver to do the, the, uh, the vibration in, free, in uh, FreeCAD, and we also, for the electronics, we use KiCAD to do everything. <laughs> so, as uh, I mentioned before, the PicoBus was developed in a really short time. So, now, eventually, we had a bit of time to develop the version 2 of the PicoBus. Uh, so, by using the tools that we mentioned, we actually were able to do a lot of improvements that uh, were obvious with the PicoBus V1. Uh, so, the most... Uh, the, the improvement that uh, mattered the most was uh, the mass improvement that we did. So because it was designed in such a short notice, we had a lot of big safety factors and uh, we tried to do it really quickly. So now we had more time to do simulations and more time to do design stuff. So by iterating the plates, we actually managed to uh, cut the mass in half of the deployer. So uh, right now, Again, the capacity is the same. It can ha house up to eight uh, satellites inside. It's almost half the mass <laughs> of the PicoBus V1. It has a, la a larger satellite envelope, which means you can fit more stuff around the satellite. But it has a smaller deployer envelope overall. So it's a bit a smaller deployer. And again, it has uh, updated electronics because we found some minor issues, so we fixed them. So we did a really cool thing, uh, again, with the isogrid patterns that you can see there. It's really space rated. <laughs> so we had like an aluminum frame this time, not a, 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 just a plate. And we closed it with a huge PCB, an FR4 PCB, and polyamide tape, cut of tape, uh, pretty much. So we closed it, and it was secured. We will see how that goes. We will uh, start the manufacturing the next month, and the expected loss of this is, the, is the, in the next few years. So, before we leave, a few words about the PicoBus story. Uh, so, PicoBus 1 was integrated, as uh, Elias mentioned in the previous talk, and uh, was launched, actually, but uh, the launch, again, didn't go as planned. <laughs> yeah, it was uh, a really sad thing to, see, to watch, but space, these things happened, explosion happened. So, but there was a plot twist. We received a phone call uh, from uh, the guys uh, at Firefly, and they said, sometime, we think we found your payload. <laughs> we were like, <laughs> what do you mean? It just blew up at 15 kilometers. Like, <laughs> you, you cannot do this. It's space. What do you mean? Uh, no, no, no. We, we think you f we found your payload. Isn't it pick up us like that? We're like, yes, but so they found our payload. 
<laughs> so that's the pico bus that survived through a rocket explosion <laughs> at 15 kilometers. <laughs> And there's more. It was okay. <laughs> we opened it, removed the satellites. They worked. <laughs> it was, everything was so okay that we thought they didn't launch it. <laughs> the only thing broken was this electronics cap and this poor capacitor. <laughs> it was amazing. It was like it didn't even warp. Like, it was great. And they actually sent us photos of uh, the Pico bus mounted on a carbon fiber part from the payload bay and we think that this huge carbon fiber part reduced the drag and they found it in a beach <laughs> near Van der Beek's Space Force Base when it was launched. It was like in the middle of the sand, two meters in front was sea, two meters from the back it was rocks. <laughs> we have photos but we cannot share them unfortunately because they don't let us but it looked pretty much like this. <laughs> So yeah, Picobas survived because space is hard. Picobas seem to be harder though. <laughs> so <laughs> I will close with this really cool video, which is the orbital Picobas. This again is provided by Firefly. They had the camera on board, so let's just enjoy it for some seconds. <laughs> Open source space, everyone. <laughs> so unfortunately, because of uh, the launcher, they didn't have, as Elias mentioned, they didn't uh, have the down, they didn't downlink the open Pico bus. So that's what we get, which by by far it's a uh, great like Pico bus <laughs> with the Earth. Like <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, that's it for me. Yeah, that was another deployer actually. So, uh, real funny, really quickly, when uh, we were watching the stream, and there was a cut in the stream, and uh, everyday astronaut at the time said that uh, they had confirmation that all three payloads were deployed successfully, and the stream came back and we saw this, and the door was closed. And we were like, <laughs> no, come on. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, after that, the uh, Cubics worked and beaconed, so, yeah, successful deployment, everyone. <laughs> so I will keep that uh, there. And I'm open to questions if you want. Thank you for the talk. Why is so much solid structure around the outside even required? So the question was uh, why so much solid structure is required. So it's not really. <laughs> In the Picobus V2 you can see it, it's a, a, a more lightweight, but uh, Pocket cubes are light, they are 250 grams, but when you have eight of them, it's a bunch of kilos. Okay, so when you place it in the rocket, the acceleration, it's a really hard uh, phenomenon. So you need actual structures to hold the rail in place so it doesn't move in place, it, it doesn't move everywhere. So the plates on uh, the sides of the deployer actually held the rail in, rail, rail in place. So you also need to sustain the vibrations too. So you need to have a bit of a mass to absorb these uh, vibrations too. In the Picobus V2 actually, we Instead of having a solid plane, we have like two ribs. I can show it in the presentation. You can see it actually. We, are, we have like the design is uh, two ribs that secure the rail pretty much. So here is attached to the rail. So when you have the whole rail protruding out, you need to support it like that. So we did a lot of weight saving by doing this. And you also need to have it separated from outside from everything else. So you need to have the deployer closed. So in case a satellite has a malfunction or it breaks or whatever, the deployer contains the satellite's malfunction too. So you need to have it closed. Did I cover your question? Yeah, yeah. You. thank you. Uh, thank you very much and congratulations. Oh, you're welcome. My <laughs> yeah. question was in a uh, eventually version 3 or version 4, would you consider also having a communication bus to communicate with the satellites while they're inside the deployer for system checkouts, for example? Uh, so we don't know yet. To be honest, it would be a case. I don't know, we can ask the electronics guy. Have you ever thought about uh, this? So, yeah, maybe. What uh, it would be beneficial for the other version was to provide uh, the chance of charging the satellites. So, for the people that put the satellites inside, whether it's us or other people, to have like a way to charge them, 
after the integration. That would be a next step too. About communicating with the satellites, I don't think so because, I don't know, but I don't think so because when they are inside, they are, they, there are kill switches that are pressed. So the satellites do not uh, start beaconing or deploying or whatever. In the cubic, you can see the two switches on the bottom plate. This, so when they're inside, they completely shut down. Yeah. Uh, yeah here. Yeah. What kind of simulations did you perform? On Raise your hand, I cannot see you, sorry. Yes, ah, here. yeah, there. What kind of simulations did you perform, and did those simulations inform further iterations of the design? Yeah, oh, they did. <laughs> so much. Like, uh, we do static simulations to simulate the static loads and see if they can withstand these loads. And we also do the model simulations that I mentioned before, because in order to do the vibration testing, we have to fly from Greece to Spain. <laughs> So we need to be sure that, uh, sure. We need to have a measure <laughs> to see the eigenmodes and stuff. So we do vibration testing and static simulations. Uh, so here it's a pretty good example because uh, we did, uh, through simulation, we reduced the mass, actually, of the part. Hi. Hi. In your test deployment video, um, when the door opened, there was a certain amount of bounce. Uh, so, did you have to take precautions to try and make sure that the satellites didn't hit the door on the way out? Yeah, so the, spring are, the springs, uh, in the door there is a hinge mechanism, so it has two torsional springs and are really, really strong. So, the backlash is minimal. Now, in the V2, we are thinking about adding a locking mechanism to it, so the door doesn't bounce back. But it's not such a huge uh, problem, to be honest, because even in the open position, Picobus, uh, in the Picobus door, has a bit of preload because of the torsional springs themselves. Their legs are a bit angled. So even in the open uh, position, there are like half a newton meter of torque. So it stays there. Okay, Welcome. Yeah. There was a front uh, oh. question, uh, some here. But yeah, yeah, okay. Hi, uh, thanks for the talk. Uh, did you know why the door closed after the deployment? Oh, it didn't. No, it, it didn't. It was, uh, it stayed open. Uh, it, it, you mean when they reached orbit, correct? No, it stayed open. It didn't close. So why did it look like it was closed? Yeah, because Firefly, the Firefly stream uh, ca was cut, and we didn't have uh, footage of the door being open. We only have uh, footage of the door being closed before the satellites uh, came outside the deployer. No, no, it stayed open, but we just don't have footage because the stream was cut from the rocket, the stream. <laughs> they, they didn't downlink this uh, specific part. Yeah. Uh, do you do you damp the vibrations in any way from the rocket uh, through the uh, pickup bus into the satellites? Uh, as far as I know, no. We certainly don't. I don't know if there is any such mechanism in the payload bay of the rocket itself. But as far as I know, no. We certainly do not. We have time for one more question. Hi, thank you for the talk. I just wanted to ask, what science did you do? Is this just proof of concept to show it would work? For, you mean for the deployer, I, I assume, not the satellite itself, so... Yeah. Oh, sorry. Uh, what science? Deployer is pretty much a box, <laughs> so... <laughs> it has one work uh, to do, deploy the satellites outside. So there is the aspect of the proof of concept and the mechanical functionality of this thing. We managed to build it and make it TRL-9, so it worked in space. <laughs> So that was uh, the goal, to have this kind of box work in space and deploy the satellites. But the science behind it, it doesn't have an ex experiment, maybe. You can say that the experiment was to deploy the satellites, actually, if you want. <laughs> yeah. Okay, th thank you for a very interesting talk. Thanks. Thank you.